Chloe, where should I be feeling this podcast? Well, if you'd like to know where you should be feeling it, uh, listen to this podcast. Maybe it's just because I've been sitting down for too long. Hey, Chloe. Hey, Ralph. How are you going? Yeah, I'm awesome. How are you? You're awesome. I'm good. I'm good. You're, yeah, I'm good. You uh, you enjoying lockdown? Not so much, which is why I'm not I'm not going with <laughs> I'm not going with awesome. The first week I was like, yeah, okay. The second week I was a bit like, mm, it feels a little mundane. Mm. Um, yeah, I feel you know. I'm I mean I'm single single person living by myself uh, without without my family very very close they're close ish but not close um so yeah it's it's been interesting i mean i've got my hilarious kittens and they've definitely <laughs> definitely been keeping me busy um but it was exciting to i think i've seen some news come through in the last hour that looks like we will be coming out of lockdown as planned at the end of this week yeah, so that's awesome Yay. And I think I'm, I'm quite acutely aware too that there's a lot of people that it's really tough for yeah. and um, particularly in our industry, people who's who've had to close their studios and gyms, et cetera. So I think uh, a lot of the a lot of the industry uh, are feeling it, but I'm also stoked to see how they just seamlessly went back online. It was like, mm-hmm. okay, cool, let's go. And all um, my teacher friends who I've spoken to uh the, the clients of their studio which is straight away booking to be online. So that's really cool. Yeah. So yay, yay to that part of the industry. I think um, Pilates has done that so well since 2020, which is really exciting. Yeah. I think there's been a tectonic shift in the industry and I think we're going to continue to see that over the next 12 months mm. towards, mm. Um, towards online. And I, I don't think the face-to-face – Delivery of Pilates will ever go away, but I think no. uh, online is going to have a huge part in the in the future of the industry. Totally, and I love um, I love the influence that online has had on the industry as a whole. Looking at things like hands on assists, mm-hmm. do we need to do them anymore? Mm, no, like we just really don't. I, I get that for some people they still see it as as important, or maybe they feel that they're for their client base it's important. Um, but I know for myself, I will never go back to doing hands-on assists. And uh, a lot of um, a lot of the teachers that have been in the industry as long as me, if not longer, have also come to that conclusion. Mm-hmm. Uh, so more self-efficacy for clients. Guess what? They can do it without me needing to manhandle. And maybe just even like, you know, thinking about it a bit more respect for personal space and all those sorts of things. Like I'd actually don't feel the need to step into someone's personal space like that anymore, um, which for me has been a big, sh- yeah, I, I really enjoy it and love seeing where my clients have been going without without me, yeah, hands-on assisting them. Yeah, I, I used to be really big on hands-on assists and um, had an interesting conversation with the Q&A group a few weeks back about it ah. um, and, you know, we're just kind of hearing people's different experiences, both giving and receiving um, hands-on assists and a couple of people's, you know, we're talking about, should you ask permission was the question that we're, we're talking about. And, and, you know, a couple of people saying, yeah, I always ask permission and, you know, that's all good. And then one woman spoke up and said, well, actually I'm in this class where the instructor always asks permission and I don't want, I don't want hands-on assists, but I also don't want to speak up and say, I don't want hands-on assists. Yeah. Um, and so, and then someone else, and so that sort of really made me think, and then someone else said, well, yeah, what I do is I actually have on my intake form, you know, when, when people first come to the studio, you know, would you like hands-on assist? Yes, no. Um, and I thought, what a brilliant idea, because that way people can can kind of in a, in a safe, sort of anonymous, semi-anonymous way say, you know, whether they want it or not. I had that when I went to a massage therapist somewhat recently, because uh, something I really hate is when I go to the massage therapist and I'm trying to relax there and they're, they're talking to me. Oh, how was your weekend? Blah, blah, blah. Like, oh, yes. Um, I'm the same. <laughs> I'm and the same. I'm the same when I get my hair cut. I don't want them to talk at me. I just I just want to like just. Yeah. I'm silent. the same when I go and get this, I sometimes go and get this LED light thing at the beautician and it's, I just want to be left alone, but they feel like they need to come in and check on me and mm. talk to me. Mm. And by that stage, I've gone into this just beautiful, chilled out, meditative mm. state 
and they totally bring me out of it. But I feel uncomfortable saying, can you not talk to me? Yeah. Yeah. Well, um, I think this massage therapist that I go to now, the re- just about the re- main reason I go there is because when you fill out your form online and they, and book it, that says like, would you like, do you prefer conversation or silence? Wow. And so I just got to tick, no, I prefer silence. And it's like, yeah, basically didn't say a word the whole time. It was awesome. So, yeah, so I reckon, yeah, we could, I, I think, uh, you know, just what you said, we're saying about um, hands-on assists, that I think... Uh, even if you're somebody who, you know, asks permission, it could well be the case that a lot of the people who are there silently accepting your hands on assist possibly don't want them, but are too sort of awkward to say it. Yeah. And um, Raf, another way I've seen that facilitated really well uh, was in a yoga class that I went to um, quite a few years back now. Basically, when we were all at the start of the class, and I think we were all just in like a, a child's pose, um, and she went around and gave us all a card and basically you could choose to either put the card up a certain way. There was a card up, which has like, I think it had like a a little hand on it or down and you left it up if you wanted hands on assist Mm -hmm. and you left it down if you didn't. Mm -hmm. And that was a really lovely way to do that too, because it gave you autonomy and she would only give you a hands on assist if the card next to you had the little hand facing Mm -hmm. upwards. Mm -hmm. Isn't that cool? Yeah, that was that's awesome. Um, at at uh, at Breathe While Being, the studio I started more than a decade ago, we started out. We had this crazy system um, where to get into class because we only had a certain number of spots in the class. We had these little um, pewter Buddhas and turtles, you know, little figurines about an inch an inch tall that one of the owners had got from Bali. And so basically, you came in, you swiped in your mind body online tag and then you got your little buddha if you were doing yoga or your little turtle if you were doing pilates and you you know then you had to go in and give that to the instructor or stick it next to your mat you know um because we had a couple of incidents where we had like the class was full and then someone else came in and they had their booking and they came in and was like oh we've got one too many people in the class you know so how do we manage that uh, and anyway, so, but what we found was it was such a terrible system, even though the Buddhas and turtles were really <laughs> cute, is that basically <laughs> the instructors would always forget to to collect them and clients would just stick them in their ba- handbag when they went to get change. And so like people ended up having like 20 of these things at home because every night they'd get home after class and be like, oh, what's this Buddha in my handbag for? And so anyway, we, anyway, it was just a terrible system. So... <laughs> That's just one of the things you learn as you go along. Oh, it's so funny. We do learn. Yeah. But yeah. So, okay. Well, that's really cool. So I think there's, there's, you know, it's a, it's a deeper discussion. It's, it's something to think about. It's definitely a shift in the um, stratosphere and in the Pilates stratosphere and potentially in the yoga stratosphere as well, uh, since we've had a global pandemic and, you know, we've had to reassess how are we teaching, how close are we getting to our clients and what do we want the, the new, the new world to look like really Mm. we've got a chance here to to construct and maybe you know leave some old ways behind and I know I certainly will be leaving for me I'm leaving hands-on assist behind and for me I'm actually leaving teaching face-to-face behind because I really much prefer doing it online so Mm. yeah Yeah. loving it um okay so but today we're not talking about hands-on assist because we already have a Pilates elephants um episode dedicated to that uh, way back in the catalogue. Uh, so I'm sure you've already listened to it. And if you haven't, go back and have a listen. It was it was back in the early days, Raph. Yeah, back, it, back it in our formative back, years. It was back when I was still recording from my tiny little Paddington apartment in Sydney. Oh, so, right. yeah, a bit, bit of nostalgia there. Uh, but what are we going to talk about today? What's today's topic? Well, today's topic is where should I be feeling this? Where should I be feeling this? Yeah. So cool. Where should I be feeling it? We can give a little little shout out to to Anula really for kind of coining the coining the phrase and and uh, she had a great workshop uh, called exactly that. Where should I be feeling it? Yeah. And I did that workshop and it was it was awesome. And what was the answer? Where should you be feeling it? <laughs> Wherever so you're feeling it. Wherever you're feeling it oh, okay. <laughs> is correct. So. T-L-D-R, <laughs> wherever you're feeling it. So, but so, yeah, so what, what, inspired this, what inspired this episode, Chloe? Yeah, so this uh, episode has been inspired by um, – it's been inspired by 
listeners who are potentially not indoctrinated in the Breathe EDU um, curriculum, uh, also inspired by some who who are within within our curriculum who are still um, processing, uh, not needing to tell our clients where they should be feeling it and also how to talk to our clients when they're asking, where should I be feeling it? Um, so it's, it's even though we've done a whole episode on queuing, we've done an episode on alignment protocol, not being a thing. We've done uh, a lesson, uh, an episode on um, the dangers in safety culture. We've done all of that, but we're still having requests for we want more. We still want to understand how to apply this in in a real life setting. Um, and also I still see it come up with our, our students in the learning process uh, with um, those sort of cues still creeping in. And I do believe that's simply because they see it happening so much out there in the Pilates um, stratosphere, mm-hmm. definitely not in the Breathe EDU masterclasses. And what I would say in regards to that too, I get a lot of um, our listeners reach out and go, I need to see this. I need to see this in real time. How do I book in to a class with you? Well, what you do is you jump onto the Breathe Education website and you book in for some of our masterclasses because every single one of our trainers is next level brilliant. Um, They're all unique in uh, the class styles that they will present to you. But one thing that they do all have that is absolutely the same is how to facilitate motor learning, how to use external cues. Um, So please, please, please book into our masterclasses. It does not need to be with me at all. In fact, I'm sure many of our trainers do it better than me. So you know, don't feel like you have to, I feel like a lot of reaching out saying I need to book into your class, Chloe. You don't. Our trainers are second to none. Oh, you absolutely can. But in regards to Breathe EDU, I've I've got one masterclass a week. Um, So please, please come to that. But please also, all of our trainers are fucking awesome, Ralph. Mm. Uh, and I'm, I'm, I learn something from them every time. I even just get to see a snippet of something they're teaching. I'm like, oh, that's so good. That's so awesome. Okay. Well, we've got so, almost yes. a dozen trainers now, both in Australia and the US, and more on the way. Yeah. Yeah. Oh my God, Heath did this incredible thing the other day where, and this was this was actually in the diploma masterclass. So, uh, clinical Pilates folks, this was uh, crab into Restless Bridge on the mat, stay in Restless Bridge, do a few few extra movements in Restless Bridge, uh, go back into crab. Awesome. Um, to me, that's like the coolest thing I've seen since sliced bread. Rough. Like that was just like, I was like, oh, my gosh, I bow down, Heath. <laughs> like <Makes laughs> that's inspiration. A bit of back arch and bridge on the spine corrector. No. Ooh, yum. Yeah, spine corrector. <laughs> No Civic to the max 5,000, but what a freaking, um, <laughs> that's a saying that my best friend and I have to the max 5,000. Sometimes we say repeater if we want to really like expand on it, <laughs> but um, it just means that that's like really like, mm, could we get a better name for it? But uh, what a fantastic apparatus to to get some back bendy deliciousness on. So um, how how do we... Where do we go? How do we, how do we compart? How do we chunk this to present it? Well, I think uh, you know the 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 question that I saw or heard. I can't remember if you read it to me or I read it somewhere from from a listener was when something like, okay, it's sort of you know like I get the external queuing thing and we're telling people to wrinkle their t-shirt or push the foot bar away or whatever, but. You know, so how do we use, an, you know, two, two questions. One, how do I use an external cue to tell someone which body part they should be feeling it in? And two, what do I say to my client when they say, where should I be feeling this? Mm. And, yeah, awesome, Raf. And also I think something on trainers' minds is should our clients be feeling an exercise in a certain position? And if they're not feeling it in a certain position, does that mean either 
they're doing it wrong or, or, and I think this is maybe something that comes up quite acutely in teachers' minds, particularly newer teachers, am I teaching it wrong? Mm. If they're not feeling, if they're not feeling their bum burning scooters, if they're not feeling their abs burning the hundred, mm. am I failing as a teacher? Mm. Well, let's start with that one, shall we? Is yeah. Cool? Yeah, let's. Um, and, you know, so I think, um, you know, I used to feel that way as well. It's like, you know, my job, I used to think my job was to have my clients feel certain physical sensations during class, you know, like feel a burn in certain body parts or whatever, depending on what, what areas we're working. And I consider, you know, I was very, you know, I was very chuffed with myself that, you know, I was very proud I could get anyone's bum to burn or get anyone's abs to burn. You know, that was my, you know, claim to fame. And now, Butts, abs and tries. I could get yeah. those tries, abs burning. That's, yeah. But, um, I don't – now looking back, I'm pretty sure that I couldn't get anyone's bum to burn, but there were probably people who just didn't feel it and then didn't come back to my class and didn't tell me or they smiled and nodded when I asked them, but really they weren't feeling it there um, or, you know, a bunch of other things. But I think, you know, it's 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 undeniable that, you know, not everyone feels an exercise in this in, – in, you know, like if you ask a room full of people, where are you feeling this, you know, you won't get the same answer from everybody. Some people say, oh, it's my bum. Other people say, it's my hamstrings. Other people say, it's my quads, Other, you know. Um, and so, you know, I think the question then is like, well, do, do, you know, why is that? You know, why why do I feel this in my quads and you feel it in your bum? Or why do you feel it in your bum and I don't feel it anywhere, you know? Mm. Or, or and I think there the, well, the, there there's not really any way that we could know for certain, you know, TLDR, but I think there are many <laughs> possible explanations, right? So just say we're, mm-hmm. we're doing an exercise that is, I don't know, say uh, we're doing lunges, right? And, you know, the instructor's saying, okay, everyone, this is a bum exercise. And you're going like, oh, yeah, my bum's on fire. That's awesome. I'm doing it right. And I'm thinking like, oh, no, I only feel this in my quads. I can't feel it in my bum at all. Or know? my calves. Or I had one client that used to feel it in her nose. Huh. Huh, not joking. Interesting. Yeah. Um, um, you got me stumped on that one. Uh, yeah, yeah. Well, <laughs> human beings are unique and fascinating and I was just like, cool, awesome, keep going. Right. Um, <laughs> so, you know, all right, so why am I feeling it in my quad? Do you feel in your bum? Well, maybe my bum is really strong and not working that hard doing these particular lunges and your bum's a lot weaker and that's why it's working hard and you're feeling it more. Or maybe my quads are really weak and they're working harder in this one compared to your quads. Your quads are fine. They're not feeling it because they're just ticking over there at idle. Okay. And that's why I, I can feel it more in my quads. I can't feel it in my bum. Maybe I'm just not that perceptive and, and my bum's working just as hard as yours, but I, I'm just not tuned in. You know, I just can't notice it as much as you can. Maybe I've got a longer femur, you know, thigh bone relative to my tibia, right? So there's actually a, a more... Uh, there's a longer moment arm for my quads. So they're actually having to work harder to overcome that longer moment arm, you know, because you've got shorter femurs, so your quads aren't working as hard. You know, there is maybe... Maybe I'm more conditioned to the movement. Right. Maybe you've the done movement. it more times. Like, like sometimes when, you know, back when I was teaching in face-to-face capacity and was teaching like... I'm talking 30 classes a week and, you know, I'd jump on and I I swear I would have done a scooter 50 million times, right, in a week, 50 million. (laughs) I think I might be exaggerating. Sorry, everyone. But a lot. Look, a lot. Okay. (laughs) To repeat up. But a lot. And I, you know, rarely did I experience any sensation in a scooter. It was just like, it was such, it was just like, let's just go, such repetitive movement. You know, now, when I don't do them very often, yeah. whoo, hello, it's well, like fire city you know, with like, five reps. You know, when, um, I mean, now I'm, I, I'm sure you don't ever do this, Chloe, but I do it. And I imagine some of our listeners do it. Do you ever buy a whole tub of ice cream? Like not the not the tiny individual. Like what do you, you mean? Know? You don't think I would do it, Raf? I buy a whole, whole tub of ice cream all the time. Okay. We want to talk about ice cream. Right. Oh, I love ice. cream. I've got Raf. Hey, I've got the biggest sweet tooth. Yeah. I have had. Oh, I am a sweet tooth gal since I was a little kid. So 
everything, my dad getting me to do anything, including going to the football when I didn't want to, or stopping crying about the fact I'd been stung by one of his bees and had a massive allergic reaction. The answer to everything was, here's a bag of mixed lollies from the corner oh, shop. Well, I'm going to file that under how to get on with Chloe and um, bear that in mind. Bag of mixed that. lollies, bag of mixed lollies, and I'm, a, I'm like soothed. Okay, great. <laughs> Psychologically that's, soothed. That's, that's, that's good to know. Yeah. So, well, you know, I know this is this is probably your experience then. So you buy that you know big tub of ice cream water and you, you agonise at the at the shop for ages. Will I get the you know swirl caramel? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I agonise over flavours, sure. Right, and then then you go home and, and when you've chosen just right, right, you know, because you never can tell until you get open and you open and you take the first mouthful and you're like, oh yeah. You know? So good. <laughs> so good. Oh, you, I think you're getting me all like Pavlov's dogs well, here. You know, I'm like starting to salivate. <laughs> I'm not sure if this is a thing or if, if Jules and I just made it up, my wife, but we like um, gelati. You know, you can buy like the gelati in a tub and we yeah. get these um, digestives like McCavity's. They're kind of just like wheat biscuits. Oh, that yeah, are, yum. They're not super sweet. They're sweetish biscuits, but they're not like really. Chocolate sweet. on one side? Yeah, 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 yeah. And then you kind of crush them up and, 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 you know, sprinkle them on the ice cream. So you get, it's kind of like cookies and cream, but it's not mixed in, you know. Oh my anyway, God, yeah. So when, when you've got a big bowl of that, you take your first mouthful and you're like, oh yeah, this is, yeah. <laughs> this is what I'm talking about, right? Yeah. But then by the time you've like, you know, chowed down like a bowl and maybe a second bowl and you're starting on your third bowl, it's like <laughs> each, each mouthful <laughs> is a little bit less pleasurable than the one yeah. before. Right. Yeah, I'm and with you. By the time you're almost at the bottom of the tub, you're right, feeling sick. You're, you're like, Why you're just kind of that? eating mechanically, and yes. you're not even enjoying it anymore. <laughs> <laughs> you've described you've described uh, my experience to a T, right? Yeah. Yeah. And um, and I get to that point, I go, why did I do that? Because those first like those first few bites were out of this world amazing. Could have just stopped after yeah, that. Yeah. yeah. But you want you seek that same, you know, pleasure hit again. Obviously. Yeah, okay. Okay, but, this is great. Yeah. But that's that's uh, you know, I'm not sure what the name of that phenomena is. I, I think it's called hedonic adaption, actually, is what it's called. So basically, you know, hedonism is pleasure and adaption. Hedon, basically you get used to it. Hedonic right? adaption. You get okay. used to it, right? Yeah. So if you haven't had ice cream for a while, that first mouthful is the best, right? The second one is still pretty good, but not quite as good. And then each one is, again, not quite as good, not quite as good. And by the time you get to the 50th mouthful, you're like, yeah, whatever, you know, I could have a piece of celery now. I'd enjoy it just as much. You know? <laughs> Probably more <laughs> at that point. You're craving celery. <laughs> and, 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 and really, I get to the point where I, I literally can't taste it. It's like I can feel right. the cold of it in my mouth, but right. I, I, I can't detect the flavor anymore. Right. You know? um, whereas that first mouthful, often the flavor just explodes. You know, yeah. it's like you can feel it through your whole body. They're <laughs> like a massage too sometimes, yeah. those first couple of, and then you're like, oh my God, this is amazing. Then you're like, and then you kind of get to the point, I kind of get to the point where I'm like, this is just kind of annoying me now. You is get it? bored, yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 Um, <laughs> okay, so we're relating this back to what scooters? Yeah, to scooters is like, well, yeah. maybe you're just like super used to doing scooters, and you're just not as you know, it's like your fiftieth scoop of ice cream, and you're just like, yeah, whatevs, you know, like I can feel my, my foot pushing against the thing, right? But yeah. it's not, it's not like setting my soul on fire. Anymore. And I think you see that. You see, I mean, I would see that. I used to have the clients, and I'm sure our listeners do too. The client that comes to you, like, like if you're teaching five separate classes that week, they will be at your five classes. Mm. And and you kind of see by the end they're just sort of like, like you know, they're going through the motions yeah. and they're still laughing at your jokes, bless. But are they are they sort of grimacing and oh, and grabbing at their butt and whatnot like they did in the early classes in the week? Not really. Yeah. Or like when yeah. you, you know, when you binge out on a series on Netflix or Amazon Prime or something, and it's so awesome that you discover a new series and you just love it, you love it, you love it, and you can't get enough, and then you're up to season two, season three, and halfway through season three, you're like, yeah, this is kind of getting boring. No, nah, it doesn't happen for me. What? No. Nah. No. Nah, I'm like, no, nah, I love I love a season. I just I like seasons upon seasons. No. Really? No, I'm, yeah, no. Nah. No, nah, it's my favourite pastime watching Netflix, Raph. Really? Really? <laughs> Yeah, and I'm going back over Outlander again because it's been so long. I've got a Droughtlander. It's been so long since they brought the new season out due to COVID. I've gone back to the start. Oh, you're lucky. That's great. <laughs> I'm going again. <laughs> no, I mean, you're lucky because you, you, you maintain your, your ah, enjoyment of it. Yeah, I'm like that with books too. Yeah. yeah. yeah I, I stay interested in books, but Netflix, not so much. 
Interesting. Yeah. Interesting. I've yeah. got all of these things when I open it up. It's like continue watching. It's all these things I've half watched, you know, because I yeah, watched right. the first half and then I got bored. Ah, <laughs> uh, okay, okay. No, I'm, I'm into that. But I, but I get you on the I get you on the ice cream thing. Mm. So yeah. anyway, I mean, you know, we're just waxing philosophical here, but. I think Which is fun to do, quite like a wax philosophical. There are there are numerous biomechanical and neurological and psychological reasons, you know, potential reasons why <laughs> someone might not feel it in a particular body part. Can we talk about Raf um, something that you spoke about in uh, one of your awesome uh, diploma lectures? And shout out to our diploma of clinical Pilates. Um, you know, if you're interested, jump into our show notes because there'll be be a link to you know, have a chat about have a chat about joining us for it. Because I mean, I'm seeing the diploma, the new diploma for the first time, and I'm someone who's been through the diploma as a student. I'm someone who's taught the diploma uh, prior to this new diploma, and getting to go through this new diploma is so fun for me to to learn again and experience what you're putting out there, Raf, which is just like so awesome. And your lex- lectures are just I'm going to have a moment here of just praising your lectures, Raf, because they're just second to none. They just keep getting more and more brilliant. We we rave about them in the shoots. We're like, how good was Raf's lecture this week? Um, but something that you, I, I'm loving all um, the different research I'm getting to to see with you uh, with the the dip lectures, and I loved the one you spoke about not this week but the week before when we were talking about. Um, muscle tests and why they're not telling us what we think they might be telling us. And there was a great study uh, that you talked about how uh, different people's muscles fire in different patterns. Could we, so if we, you know, I, I know that our listeners like to, they want some, you know, we can talk, we can wax lyrical about ice cream and whatnot, but we know too that our listeners, they want a bit of, bit of a juicy, a bit of you know, <laughs> buy a bit of substance. <laughs> we can bring the substance some, up with the some, wax lyrical. Put some digestive biscuits in there. That'll put substance in it. Raph, do you know what I'm eating tonight? I'm so excited after my masterclass, I'm going to go and get ice cream and digestives, mm. and I'm going to try and stick to one bowl just so I can keep the enjoyment factor. We'll see well, how it goes. If, if you'll have more enjoyment, I reckon, in the in that tub of ice cream, if you have a bowl and then wait a few days and have another bowl and then – and do that rather than if never you done like- it again. Never done it in my life, but I'm willing right. to. I'm willing to do an experiment. Let's do it as an All experiment. Right. All right. Um, so let's. I'd love you to talk about that paper. Have you got that somewhere to hand? Uh, yes. Yeah, so I think this. You're talking about um, a paper that where we talked about the um, the prone hip extension test. Um, yes. Where basically, you know, and I did this when I did my stop Pilates injuries in special populations um, training. Uh, and you know, one of the things that we we uh, learned there was, um, you know, you, you basically to test some, whether someone's glutes are firing. Um, and we're told so basically, you lie. And your everyone, client, by the way, hey, Raf, some of us, some people might not be able to see what you radio, visually yeah. just did there. Yeah, can you just, <laughs> so just verbalize just, air quotes? Well, please? basically, anytime I say glutes are firing, just assume that I'm putting air quotes around it for the rest of eternity. Um, <laughs> But, just in yeah. case for editing purposes, something <laughs> happens and you go out with. <laughs> there were air quotes. Um, mm-hmm. So yes, yeah, so we, uh, you know, we were taught, and I'm, I imagine this is pretty common in a lot of you know Pilates and physical therapy and whatever, where you're taught basically you lie the person on their tummy, mm-hmm. okay, and then you put one hand on their low back and one hand on their glute and one hand on their hamstring. And I don't, I'm not sure how you meant to do that, but. Wait, how many hands have you got? Well, I, I can't remember how we did it, whether we did like multiple tests. One you went octopus? The, one with the hand on the hamstring and one with the hand on the glute, one with the hand on the lower back and one with the hand on the hamstring. I, I can't remember which one. But anyway, <laughs> you, 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 you know, or if you put your elbow on their butt and your hand, I, I can't remember. It doesn't matter. <laughs> but um, basically you wanted to palpate, okay, the, which just means to feel, their lower back muscles, their glute muscles and their hamstring muscles. And when so this test is relying on someone else's feeling. It's just highly unreliable. With their yeah. This is so, I'm sorry, but yeah. throw it, throw it yeah. out, yeah. throw it out the window. Yeah. It's, it's yeah. low quality. Throw it out um, the window. Uh, and then basically they lift their, you know, give, ask them to lift up one leg. 
you know, so lift your right leg, for example, and you're palpating their right glute and their right hamstring. And and you can feel, or you think you can feel, whether their glute fires first or their hamstring fires first or their low back fires first. Now, all of those muscles are needed for that movement, you know, because your, your low back muscles stabilize your pelvis as in stop it moving. Your um, glutes and hamstrings extend the hip. So they're all recruited, but um, it's the order of how, you know, when, which comes first, second, and third. And uh, I was taught that it should be the glutes first, and I can't remember what it was, the hamstring second or the low back second, yeah. but, you know, it was the glutes first. That was the big takeaway in, in my mind. Yeah. Um, and uh, that's based on some research by Vladimir Yonder in the 1950s. Um, uh, but basically there's a, a, a study um, from 2004. Actually, Gregory Lehman is the lead author. On this study. Ooh, shout out, Greg. Um, it's called Muscle Recruitment Patterns During the Prone Leg Extension Test from the British British um, uh, Medical Journal Musculoskeletal Disorders um, from 2004, Lehman et al. And what they found was they basically got, you know, I can't remember how many, let's say 50, you know, healthy volunteers with no back pain or whatever, and they put electrodes on their muscles and got them to do the prone leg extension test and measured which muscles fired first. And what they found was... People had variable motor recruitment. So, you know, not everybody had the same firing pattern. And these were all pain-free, healthy people with no issues. So there doesn't seem, you know, takeaway number one, there doesn't seem to be one, um, you know, idealized, you know, quote, correct, unquote, pattern of muscle recruitment. It's just different for different people, Right. Um, which, when you think about it, is it's like, well, fucking duh. It's like, you know. It's so it's so interesting. Like, and I'm having these conversations on the daily, and it's just it's it's just so it's so obvious, isn't it? But people just don't want to accept it. It's really interesting. It's like we are all clones. We're right. not clones. It's well, quite- if, if you think about like. Some people digest dairy product easily, others don't. You know, some you know some people have insomnia, others don't. Some people love running, others don't. Some people are tall and thin, some are short and wide. Like humans are variable. You know, yeah. we're not all the same. Yeah. <laughs> like, it, it, yeah, it, it shouldn't be such a surprise, should it? But this is that this we've anyway. For some reason, there is this want in the in the the Pilates and physio realm that want to somehow <laughs> have some control over this or yeah. somehow, yeah. We want to create yeah. this this one sort of ideal, you know, correct way of, of standing or moving or activating your muscles or whatever and go, okay, everyone should do it this exact same way. It's like that's not how humans work. We're mm. biological. We're messy, you know, like mm. there's, there's variability. Um, mm. So anyway, there were two takeaways from your study. One is that there's difference between people and there's no set pattern. Like there's not like 90% of people did it one way or anything. It's like just people just have different firing sequences. But there was one common theme, and mm. that was that glutes fired last for everyone. Wow. Yeah, glutes <laughs> fired go. last. So, um, uh, and so, you know, looking at the broader literature, you know, because there's, there's lots of other studies on this type of thing, um, and what we find is that muscle uh, recruitment is also joint angle specific and also load specific. So mm. basically, if you kind of, you know, squeeze your own butt with your hand, right, and just go for a walk around the room at a leisurely pace, you probably won't be able to detect your, your glutes at firing at all, right? That Because they probably aren't firing, right? Because your glutes mm. don't really need to fire. You don't need much, yeah. don't need much butt. At all for yeah. walking around. Walking's really out, walking efficient. It's a really energy mm. efficient way of, of getting around. You don't need to use much m- muscle for it. But if you sprint up a hill, guaranteed your glutes are going to fire. You know that was a big takeaway for me from when I did Greg's course, and I was like, okay, well, what are, if I want to if I want to truly work my glutes? Like if that is something you know that I want to do, well, sprint, sprint mm. up a hill. And mm. I started some hill sprints. I tell you what. Whew, there were some doms after that. <laughs> right. And if, or if you squat or lunge deep, you'll get your mm. glutes going more, right? So it's joint angle specific. It's load specific. Yep. It's speed specific. If you move explosively, mm. you're more likely to get your glutes firing because they're big explosive muscles. That's what they're for. Mm. So, um, you know, so there is no one sort of idealized pattern of motor recruitment. So the person who's, you know, not feeling it, it's like, why? Well, maybe... Maybe then you're not challenging them at a high enough level. You know, they're just using their hamstrings and quads because they're like in first gear, you know, mm. they haven't they haven't cranked up the machine hard enough yet. Yep. Um, yep. Yeah. So, I mean, there's, there's, you know, we could go down that rabbit hole a lot further, but I think that's probably enough, don't you? 
Yeah, that's awesome. Um, okay, so so basically the argument for where should I be feeling it or clients should be feeling it in a specific position mm-hmm. uh, and they all should be feeling it in that is just I- inaccurate. It's it's Right. Well, it's I mean, what if, what if we go out, I mean, you know, I, I think just logic, you know, regardless of the research, like just logic should be sufficient here, right? I mean, if you and I both go out and have a glass of the finest red wine, right? You know, it's $500 a bottle or whatever, right? We're not going to have the exact same capacity to detect the nuances of flavor in that wine, right? One of us is going to be more sensitive to it than the other. I don't know which one it would be, but there are people in the world who can taste the difference and other people who can't taste the difference. You know, like if you take my dad out, he can't taste the difference between freaking wine and coffee. You know, it's all the same to him. <laughs> right? And, and, and so does that mean there's something wrong with the wine or something wrong with the coffee? No, it's mm. just like his, his, his nasal passages don't work properly and he can't detect those, you know, mm. nuances of flavour. It doesn't mean the flavour's not there. Mm. You know, and I think like, well, that's the same, you know, in anything, like some people are more sensitive to chili than others, right? Other people can chow down on whole, you know, chili peppers and with the pips in and all. And other, and some people just, you know, if someone's waved a mm. chili near the dish while it was cooking sometime, they can't, you know, mm. they can't eat it. And, and that's just a normal variation in human sort of sensory sensitivity. You know, some of us can, de- can, you know, listen to a music track and, and, hear a pass, you know, P-A-R-S-E, sort of like separate out and hear like, oh, I can hear what the, the hi-hat cymbals are playing and I can hear the snare drum and I can hear the bass drum and I can hear what the bass guitar is playing and I can hear, you know, the rhythm guitar and the lead guitar and, and you know, and others can't hear any of that separate stuff. They just hear like kind of a wall of sound, right? And they oh, go, yeah, I don't I know, it just would, sounds good, whatever, yeah, you know. that would be me. <laughs> right. And, and, but that doesn't mean that the detail's not there, it just means, you know, some people are better at detecting it mm. than other people. Some people are more tuned in. You know, some people can look at a work of art and see nuances and layers and depth and other people just say, it's like, I'm not even sure if it's right way up or not. Mm. You know? Okay. So what I'm, so I'm hearing all of that, but then what I'm hearing is potentially some of our listeners going, well, does that therefore mean our clients lack proprioception or lack body awareness? And isn't it our job? And please, air quotes, isn't our isn't it our job to educate our clients on being able to tap into that feeling? Being able, to, like I, I've I've heard this a lot from from Pilates instructors in the stratosphere. Yeah, what a great and and I I think that's a really like it's a it's a serious question worth answering. I think that's a legit yeah. question. You mm. know, is that our job? Mm. Well. For me, no. For, for me, and I, sometimes I do think, Graf, what is our job is almost like a bit of a personal answer as well. Mm-hmm. But what I think our job is and what I think, uh, you know, when I'm prepping our students to go out there and be grads and go out there into the stratosphere, I think our job is to facilitate an empowering and fearless movement experience for the human beings in front of us. Mm -hmm. Okay. So to me, looping in that they should, looping in micromanagement of their bodies or telling them where they should be feeling something or telling them they're inadequate, you know, letting them feel that they're inadequate because they're not feeling something in a certain position or this or that to me, goes against goes against that mm. sort That's of like if if uh you came to my restaurant and i was the waiter there and you ordered a particular dish and then i came in and said oh chloe how's your dish can you taste the you know uh overtones of blah 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 in the you know in the dish and you're like no i can't taste that no and, and if i said no well that means you're tasting it wrong you know you need to taste this <laughs> yeah yeah, totally. It's kind of the Absol- same. It, it, it is kind of the same um, for sure. And uh, would we loop this into as well, and I we may have spoken about this on one of our other podcast episodes, but uh, teachers, instructors asking clients to, to squeeze a particular muscle part in order to help them 
activate and feel it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, like squeeze your bum, squeeze your bum, you know, as you're doing a hip, some sort of hip extension or squeeze your whatever. Mm-hmm. Uh in in a in in a sense of um, trying to get someone to feel it in a certain position, yep. uh, and, and therefore ultimately, I'm assuming that's because we want to make them stronger. Should we address that as well? I think we should touch back on that during this discussion. That yeah, that's well, ineffective as well, and why? I think that you know, I think that kind of loops into. I guess, you know, my thoughts on, you know, that question of like, well, is it actually our job to help people become more body aware? And, I, you know, I, I respect that question. I think it's a genuine question. And I think it it's, a, it's you know, it's more, com- it's kind of complex when you think about it. Like, you know, because Joseph Pilates does talk a lot about body awareness, you know, in his, in his writings. And, and at the same time, he also talks about a lot about animals and moving like animal, you know, moving like a cat. He and talks f- about and flow state. Really, yeah. there's a lot of description of flow state. Yeah, he talk he talks about young children, you know, moving yeah. moving naturally and stuff. Um, and so, and and we also talk in Pilates a lot, and and Joseph talked about this as well about ease of movement and efficiency of movement, and you know, natural movement and. Uh, you know, you know, pre- preparing people for tasks of everyday life so that, you know, they can move unconsciously and gracefully, you know, and all of that stuff goes, uh, you know, uh, along with the idea of moving like an animal, basically. Like, if you know, I mean, I think a cat is the perfect example because they just, you know, I think most people would agree that, you know, sometimes cats are a bit foolish, but most of the time they oh, move Oh, Raph, I really hope every, everyone that's listening, please jump on to Chloe and the Cats. That's Chloe without an H. If you want to see some cats acting foolishly, there is a whole Instagram page of them. But, but they, <laughs> They're hilarious, but they're very uh, – I see graceful. what you mean. They're very graceful. Even when they're doing hilarious, foolish things, they seem to do it with this level of fluidity. Right. Right, they move beautifully, and you know, I mean, if you if you just you know go up onto YouTube and watch footage of like pumas or or you know lions or tigers or panthers. Well, we know that like, JP used to love to go to New York Zoo and yeah. watch watch the big cats. I mean, they just move like you know liquid butter being poured. You know, like it's just they're just beautiful to watch, and you know, I I I don't think any of us would believe that those cats are thinking about squeezing particular muscles as they move. Mm. And in fact, what we know from research, you know, a lot of research in motor learning about, you know, what it means to move efficiently and skillfully in, in doing some activity, moving beautifully in dance or, you know, martial arts or whatever, is that as you become more skilled and efficient, well, efficiency you know, the actual de- definition of efficiency is doing more results with less effort, right? That's what efficiency means. It means using less effort to achieve the same result or a better result. And so that means, you know, in the context of Pilates, well, it means you can move the carriage or your body or the the the, the straps or whatever, the same distance at the same speed using less effort, right? That's the definition of efficient. And so, you know, why? how does cueing people to use more effort, you know, make them more efficient? Um, so that, that's... <laughs> mm. I, oh, I'm loving this. This is, this is deep. I'm enjoying this. And what I, what, as you're talking and you're saying, you know, if the, the question is, is it not our job to help people be more body aware? Well, actually, now you've got me thinking about it facilitating knowing how to facilitate motor learning effectively is actually (laughs) looping in, isn't it? To ultimately, I mean, as you progress in your motor learning of a skill, you actually do become, I guess you're more body aware, but you're, is this making sense? Well, it depends what you mean by body aware, right? Because I would I would argue that in in one sense you actually become less body aware as you become because more you're skilled. not thinking about the bits. You become less aware of your body, like literally. Yeah. Like, imagine you first start to play the piano, right? You've never played the piano before, okay? And so you're you know 
we ask you to play some song that has a bunch of chords in it, right? You're thinking about pressing down with this finger and this oh, finger and gosh, this finger and this painful. finger. And then you think about, you know, you think about pushing your right foot down on the pedal and your left hand on the, you know. Yeah, and it was so, the same as when I learned to drive. Right. It was, every, it was you know, everything was so. You're very then, much aware of each body part and the movement that you're doing at each time. Yet, yeah. you know, when you've been practicing in an hour a day for 15 years and you're highly skilled, right, as you're playing, you know, and I, I'm not highly skilled at the piano, but I'm highly skilled at a couple of things in my life, like most of us are. And, you know, like I'm reasonably highly skilled at the bass guitar, for example. And I know that as I've become more skilled at that, when I'm playing, I'm not thinking, I'm not aware of my body, about of my fingers, of, you know, I'm, I'm aware of the sounds that I'm making, you know, the mood that I'm evoking, you know, and I believe and that's, that's what all highly skilled, you know, people are aware of is, is the result of what they're doing, you know. Right. Yeah, totally. And I, with that, you've just got me looping back to Game of Tennis. And um, so the Game of Tennis is, is, a, is a great book. It was written in the 70s. Um, it was kind of a, a, an early book exploring motor learning. Mm. And we can link to it in the show notes. It's, it's a fantastic read. I've got it on my bookshelf. And in fact, we used to read it for the diploma, didn't we, Ralph? Mm, we, sure um, did. we used to read that and uh, Your Health uh, by Joseph Pilates. Gotta, gotta say, Raf. More grateful that you got me to read <laughs> Game of Tennis, but that's okay. Any Game of Tennis is all right, but your health was fun as well. Both are on my bookshelf. So uh, in a Game of Tennis is basically um, studying motor learning and, you know, the higher the higher skill of motor learning, well, the focus is on just hitting the ball, basically. It's not about, you know, what degree do I need to rotate my arm or, you know, what, what muscle do I need to ensure that I'm activating before I hit that ball? And then the higher skill, you know, the person who's just effortlessly winning that game, right? They're in a state of flow. Mm -hmm. I loved that the, the best way. So if you're ever doing something with someone like something competitive and they're winning, right? And they're just in their flow state. They're in their zone, right? They're in their zone and they're just effortlessly, effortlessly winning. Stop and ask them, ask them to explain to you what they're doing. Like ask them to stop and have to explain to you how they're winning. And it's the best way to bring them out of their flow state. Yeah. Well, I think, you know, if you ask them, okay, you know, how, how hard are you contracting your glutes as you, you know, mm -hmm. serve that tennis ball, you know? that would be the perfect way to bring someone out of flow because it would bring them out of their sort of more global uh, flow state awareness of the game and the movement of the ball and into a, of an internal focus on what's happening inside their body. And and in many respects, that's the opposite of, of skilled behavior, right? Because one of the, you know, like if you look actually at the textbook defini definitions of skill, right? And when we, so when we talk about, um, uh, uh, you know, because we were talking about um, people moving, you know, like what's our job? Is it about body awareness or is it about moving efficiently or is it about moving, you know, skillfully and gracefully? We talk often about moving gracefully in Pilates. Um, and and when we talk about moving gracefully, I think, well, okay, well, we can actually dissect that and double click on it and think, okay, what does it mean to move gracefully? Like, I mean, it's kind of like we can recognize it when we see it, you know, mm. like it's hard to describe, but it's like, you know, when you see someone moving beautifully, it's like you can, you know it when you see it, right? Like whether it's a dancer or an athlete or someone just walking down the street or whatever, like a cat, you know, and you can, there's something about the way they seem to flow, you know, like I don't mean like being in a flow state. I mean like flowing like, like honey being poured, you know, like just flowing. And, and they make something that's extremely difficult or, or challenging look really easy. Like if you see someone moving like that, they make it look effortless. Right. And that's because it is relatively effortless for that person because one of the – right, so there, there, are, there are a few kind of hallmarks of highly skilled behaviour, right? So as you become highly skilled at doing anything, regardless of what the thing is, certain things change. One is um, – increased movement efficiency, right? So you use less energy to produce the same result. And so if you're running or dancing or whatever, part of that is to do with you use inertia and momentum, you use the elastic recoil of tissues, you use a leverage, you know, like there's lots of different, um, uh, you know, sort of 
little knacks, you know, little things that people use that are highly, highly skilled so that they can run at the same speed using less energy or they can, you know, push the carriage out just as far using less muscle contraction. And that, and that is part of the definition of what it means to be more skilled. Is you, That's part of why it looks effortless because it freaking is effortless. <laughs> They're actually doing it the easy way. And so another another aspect of skilled behaviour is that it becomes automatic, right? So when you first learn something, it's very conscious and clunky and you have to think about every step of the, you know, process. And then when you're really highly skilled at something, you can basically, like, think about driving. It's a great example you mentioned before. When you first learn to drive, you really have to think about it. You have to concentrate on what you're doing. But once you've been driving for a decade or more, you can hold a conversation while you're driving. You know, you can, you know, like, you can do it completely automatically. You don't have to think about it. And that's the same with with any skilled behaviours, playing the flute or typing or, or whatever it might be, you know, doing the rollover, like it's the same process of becoming skilled is, is this process of automaticity, you know, reduce requirement for conscious attention plus movement efficiency. So it's making use of momentum, inertia, passive tissue, recoil, leverage, etc. And there are a couple of other, you know, sort of hallmarks of highly skilled behaviour. But if we're thinking about just those two aspects, like automatic, right, you by definition, what that means is you don't think about it. You know, there's no conscious attention required, right? So that seems to be the opposite of being aware of your body, right? Mm. It, seem, it seems to be the opposite of it. Mm. And then we think about, all right, well, you know, it's graceful. Well, what does graceful mean when it's at home? It means less effort to do the same job, right? It, it literally is easier for someone who's a master at something to do it than someone who's a beginner because the beginner's doing it the hard way because they don't know the easy way, right? They haven't mm. figured it out. It takes a decade of practice to figure out what the mm. easy way is, right? And so the beginner, you know, what characterizes unskilled movement is effortful, right? Lots of co-contraction of opposing muscles around a joint and high requirement for conscious attention, right? Which is, so that is you're acutely body aware in that situation, right? Mm. And we look at the expert, it's effortless and unconscious, automatic, right? And so here we are telling people to focus on their body and squeeze their muscles. Like Mm. we're promoting an effortful, highly conscious state, which is the exact opposite of Mm. skill, right? But it is more body aware, right? And Mm. So I guess, I guess, you know, where I land on that is like, well, body awareness is a thing and skilled movement are a thing, is a thing, but they're kind of opposite ends of a spectrum in my, in my view. What, what do you land on that? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I totally agree. Totally agree. Yeah. I land in the same place. You know, I think about, um, I think about like if I bring it into another Pilates context, something like teaser on the long box. So teaser on the long box, uh, you're laying over the box, hands in straps, press into the straps, you levitate up into your teaser, you roll back down. Okay. This is an exercise um, that I see people struggle with a lot. If, If I'm thinking about, if I had to pick one exercise from the reformer repertoire that that people tend to struggle with the most uh, and that I see it looking most effortful, it would be teaser on the long box, hands down, hands down, okay? Um, and what's interesting is uh, I remember when I very first learnt teaser on the long box and I felt like I was going to get pulled backwards off the box. I was going to fall. I was like, what the hell is this? This is outrageous. What are you asking me to do? You're asking me to sit up whilst pushing into straps while the load is pulling me back from behind, say what? Now for me, out of all of my movements, all of my Pilates exercises, teaser is the most effortless for me. It's my, it's my, I just, I float. I, and I feel a sensation of if you had to, dis- if you said, Chloe, what, what would you describe? How do you feel when you're doing teaser? A sensation of floating just of this smooth floating sensation. So you're not feeling it in your abs? I, uh, uh, to be honest, when I do a few reps, absolutely, I do start to feel some work in my abs, but I'm not thinking about where should I be feeling it and should the ultimate goal be I get an ab burn, mm-hmm. right? My sensation is just a smooth floating sensation. It feels 
effortless. Absolutely, the more reps I do, the more my abdominals start to fatigue. So, all right. So maybe but what I see with what I see with cueing, etc., that goes wrong with that. So this is this is my key tip for cueing with teaser is not bloody. Okay, start to activate your abs. Now roll up vertebra by vertebra. But everyone says vertebrae. You're asking them to roll up bone by bone. Please say vertebra. If you're going to say it, don't say vertebrae. Anyway, vertebra by vertebra. Make sure you're engaging. Oh, okay. Take it into the rah, right? That, that is a great way to just get people to choke halfway up in their teaser and just not be able to get up. Okay. Give the focus. So I know that people really want some more external cues from us. Push into the straps. All the focus needs to be on those straps. All of, like nothing else. Don't think about anything else in your teaser, but those straps. Dig into the straps. Push into the straps. Give me more strap. There you go. You're in your teaser. Roll down, keep some tension on the straps, keep some tension on the straps because doing that will actually control your descent back to the box. If you keep continual tension on the straps as you're going back and at the last moment you release the tension from the straps, ah, you're back in your, your start position. Yep. So that that's that, that's your, your teaser success right there. Uh, Raph, you were going to... You were going to say something? Oh, I've lost lost whatever it was that I was going oh, to say. Oh, I'm but, sorry. No, no, it's fine. No, that, that was really, really great what you said, that basically when you're pushing into the straps, and this goes with the motor learning literature, that, you know, when you focus on the, a result of the movement, you know, the strap, the movement of the straps is a result of how you're moving, and that is something that is outside your body, and that is a result of the movement, basically you're, you're focusing on the goal, the outcome, and then you, you hand over the task of planning – you know, the muscle activation and whatever to your premotor cortex and let that happen outside of consciousness, you know, so it still happens. It just, you don't do it consciously. You don't do it in your frontal cortex. You do it in your motor cortex. And, and so then that results in a more efficient movement. You know, you can get more result for less effort. Amazing. Oh my gosh, that was just that was just such a perfect summary, Raf. Um, also, I had success outside of Pilates. I was thinking about, and I'm sure this was in again. I'm, as I said, I'm loving, I'm loving the diploma, and I'm getting little juicy nuggets each lecture. And uh, I loved. It might have been a few lectures back now when we were again looking at motor learning and taking a deeper dive into motor learning. Um, and when we're talking about things like running, for instance, focusing on something in the horizon or on the horizon, like focusing on a, a distance goal, yeah, helps you more so to continue, you know, <laughs> than thinking about, you know, thinking about the your stride or um should your heel be striking before your toes or et cetera? And um, I've actually been using that really effectively with my runs lately because I've been a bit deconditioned with my running. I haven't been doing as much. So running's gone from feeling like, yay, fun, and I really love this to, <gasps> am I going to have a heart attack or throw <laughs> up? It's, it's being a bit dramatic, but it has actually been how my runs have been feeling. And, you know, we've had discussions before. I, I love running. It's very good for my um, mental health uh, as well as my physical health. I would say I probably use it for my me mental health more so um, than my physical health. Uh, but I love that I get both from it. Um, but I've noticed that I've needed extra motivation of late because it feels fucking tough again. So what I've been doing is really tapping into that. And, and when I've been feeling like, because I know there's more in my tank. I know there's more in my tank. It's literally just a motivation thing at the moment because it's not flow state for me anymore. And I know I can run further than what I think, um, but I get all up in my head like, oh, no, oh, this sucks. Oh, you can stop. So what I've been doing is I've just been using external markers and I've been like, okay, cool. Well, there's a, there's a park bench up there. I reckon I can easily get to that park bench, right? And literally as I'm running, I'm – I'm clearing my brain of anything else, any other chit chatter, whatever. And all I'm, I'm just eagle eyed focused on that bench. And it's interesting because of course I can get to the bench as I start to get close to the bench. Guess what? I find another marker, right? Cause I know I can make it to the bench. And all I do is I focus on that marker and it has 
like exponentially increased uh, the range of my run and and keeping moving mm. as opposed to stopping. So well, I think yeah, you're doing science. a couple of things there. One is you're setting yourself small goals and breaking a bigger goal into small goal and trying to semi-tricking yourself. That's like, okay, I'm only going to run to the bench, then I'm going to stop. And then you're like, okay, it is well, a bit I'm, of a trick, isn't yeah. it? Yeah. <laughs> even, and even though you know it's you tricking yourself, like it still works somehow. <laughs> it does. <laughs> um, yeah, I, you know, I do that when I run as well. I don't use the bench. I just say I'm going to run, you know, another 500 meters or whatever on the treadmill. You know, like X number of calories on the treadmill or whatever. Um, but the other thing you're doing is you're focusing outside your body. Right, mm. and and we know that um, uh, when you focus outside your body, uh, at you, you know you don't focus on your body, so you're not so you, it's the same as being distracted, right? So you, you you're yeah. you're distracted from body sensations, and we know that perception of effort is uh, drives fatigue. So when you have a high perception of effort, you know that you know so basically fatigue um, is perception of effort, uh, you know divided by intensity of uh, work, right? So if, if you're not working very hard and you perceive it as very hard, then you'll perceive yourself to be fatigued. Wait a second. If you're not working very hard, say it again, sorry, right. So if you're just, right, you just say you're jogging along on a flat surface really slowly, right? Yep. And you're going, holy hell, this is hard work, right? Right. Your brain then concludes, oh, I must be fatigued, right? Ah, Right? That's Cause, happening. Because you can feel like I'm not contracting those muscles very hard, but yet I'm feeling really this is hard work, right? Uh-huh. So therefore I must be out of shape and fatigued. Right. So that so your brain then goes, oh, well, you're fatigued. So fa- fatigue is, is you know, I mean, I've, I've oversimplified a little bit, but it's basically, you know, perception of effort divided by actual effort. Okay. There's so the difference okay. between those things. Because, you know, think about it. As you get more and more fatigued, if you start working out, right, when you're fresh, you put in a big effort, it doesn't feel that hard, you don't feel fatigued. As you get more and more fatigued, you're trying really hard, but you're actually not pushing as hard as you were at the start because your muscles are fatigued, right? You, you, so you're not contracting those muscles as hard as you were, but it feels harder. And that's that's the information that your brain uses to, you know, to tell that you're fatigued. So if you distract yourself and don't notice the effort, right, you have less perception of effort, well, that reduces fatigue. Ah. And we find that people can run further when they're listening to music or watching a video on a treadmill, obviously, compared to if they're concentrating on their breath or concentrating right. on their muscles. Okay, I'm having a moment. I'm having a moment here, Raph. I'm having a moment. I'm having a little ding. <laughs> Hopefully it was worth uh, how much. Uh, I'm given that way too much weight now. But so what I'm hearing here, like, an, so that's absolutely what I'm doing running. Now, looping back to the Pilates class, mm-hmm. So instead of telling your clients where they should be feeling it and to squeeze this and engage that and activate this and align this, if you want to get more juice out of your clients, maybe you should be pumping some tunes and giving them some fun stories to distract them and maybe giving them some little challenges like, you know, let's go for three rounds of and then keeping them inspired towards the end of that round. I know you can do it. You've got a little more juice in your tank. Let's go. Let's go. Like yeah. we should be flipping it that way, right? If, if if our ultimate goal is that we are concerned, are our clients getting a good workout? You know, are they – because all of these things we must be – I mean, you know, why, why, why else are we concerned where they should be feeling it? I mean, personally, I'm not concerned where my, should, my clients should be feeling it, but – well, I, I think that that's, there are two things there that I'd really like to touch on. One is like, okay, where should I be feeling it? I believe that's code for how do I know if I'm doing it right? Okay. Um, uh, and so, yeah, can we bookmark that? But I think that I just really want to, you know, finish off about this kind of philosophical point about, okay, well, is body awareness something we want to promote? Um, and, you know, so we just talked about the whole, you know, notion that, you know, when you're body aware – you know, you're, you're literally thinking about your body parts. Well, that's the opposite of being in a flow state. It's the opposite of being moving efficiently and it's the opposite of moving skillfully. Um, but it depends what we mean by body aware. So maybe, maybe you know, when we, you know, if we said, you know, there's some like high level martial artist walking down the street and you see them, they walk and they're moving so effortlessly and fluidly. They're just walking down the street, not doing anything special, but the way they walk, you think, oh, that person's an athlete. You know, you can kind of tell, you know, 
um, you know, or maybe they just come and sit down at a table or something and you, the way they sit down tells you it's like their balance. You spot a dancer a mile away. Yeah, like their balance is perfect and, they, you know, they don't plonk onto the chair. They kind of, you know, lightly touch the chair and then, you know, it's like it's just beautiful to watch. Well, you know, would you say, you know, if that person was not thinking about their body whilst they were moving that way, would you still say that they're body aware? You know, like they say so they, they have a high, in one sense, they have a high level of non-conscious awareness of where their body is in space, you know, and how their muscles are moving and all of that. They're not thinking about it, right? But it's, it's, it's there, like their motor cortex is aware of where their arms and legs are and all of that. And so they manage to balance perfectly and move gracefully and all of that, but they're not, their, their prefrontal cortex is not aware, you know, cause they're thinking about something else. So I guess if we would class that as being body aware, right? So they're not literally consciously aware of their body, but their, their, their non-conscious parts of their brain that plan movement are highly aware of where their body are, is and is doing a great job of planning it. Well, I think, you know, if you, if you want to call that body awareness, I think, yeah, we should be promoting that because that's, you know, that I think that's a good thing and it's a good feeling to, to be able to do that. But if, yeah, so I'm, I'm, but if, but if you think, if we think of body awareness as literally thinking about your body, then I, I don't necessarily agree that we should be promoting that. Well, hopefully this has given our listeners a lot of food for thought. I don't think I've ever thought about it so philosophically before, <laughs> ever, Raph, <laughs> ever. Uh, well, and I'm still thinking about that ice cream with the crumbled biscuits on top, if, if truth be told. There's, a, um, there's, a, there's an IGA supermarket in um, Brunswick that has a uh, chocolate nougat double-flavoured tub of gelato. Um, yeah, highly recommend. Yum. Um, okay, so you you bookmarked. You did bookmark something. What did you bookmark? Um, where should I be feeling it? Is I believe is a lot of oh, times okay. code for how do I know if I'm doing it right? Okay, so we've we've spoken right. Okay, so we've been speaking a lot from the the teacher's perspective, and we haven't yet addressed when our client asks yeah. us that. Yeah. So like when a client asks you, where should I be feeling this? Well, I reckon a lot of the time. That's because the client's like, well, I don't know if I'm doing this right. So, you know, if you tell me I'm meant to be feeling it in one place and I'm feeling it in somewhere else, that tells me I'm not doing it right. So, whereas if you tell me I'm meant to be feeling it somewhere and I'm like, oh, yeah, that's where I am feeling it, that means, oh, good, well, I'm doing it right then. So, I reckon uh, in that case, because clients come in and they want to know if they want to know if they're doing it right. You know, like we all want to know if we're doing things right when we do them. And so, if we simply give them alternative criteria to know how they're doing it right, right, often they're very happy with that. So if a client says to you, where should I be feeling this? And instead of saying in your abs or whatever, you say, well, you know you're doing it right if the straps are moving at an even pace, right? Or you know you're doing it right if when the straps come together, they're at the same height. Or you know you're doing it right if the carriage is moving silently. Or, you you know, like just give them some other criteria, right, that it doesn't tell them where they're feeling it, but says like, okay, if, if you observe this happening, that means you're doing it right. Okay. Well, I've, in my experience, a lot of people are like, oh, great. Okay, cool. <laughs> you know. Yeah, I, I absolutely, I, I, for me, it really depends who the, the individual in front of me and what sort of rapport I have with them. Um, I have been also known to say, where are you feeling it? And wherever they're feeling it, validate it. Awesome. Fantastic. Um, so, and, and that has worked really effectively Mm -hmm. for me as well. Um, I, uh, have got myself inadvertent, like the flip side is when you accidentally say something like, Oh, my bum's really burning or you're joining in with someone you're uh, as an instructor. Sometimes, you know, you're doing a bit of the class with them or something and you're just like, Oh, my bum's really burning. Wow. We all getting a good bum burn. Oh, it's the worst thing you can possibly yeah. say because you've basically it's an, it's just another way of telling your clients They're where wrong, yeah. you should be fit. Yes, yeah. and then in it without fail, Raf, I've then had someone say, "Oh no, I'm not I'm not feeling it there. I'm not yeah. feeling it. Where, what am I doing wrong?" So you've got to be really mindful of also saying 
like having those words come out of your mouth. Mm. So, um, because then they will feel like they're not doing it right. But Mm. yeah, I love that whole giving them. Um, and, and a lot of the time I will say to my clients, you, 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 you're doing everything like fantastic, like perfect. That's, that's awesome. You, you're killing it in that movement and you're doing it great. So yeah, Mm. both works. Mm. Good talk. Awesome. Do you think we've, Ticked it off. What's your favorite flavor of ice cream? Oh, my favorite flavor of ice cream. Um, no, not fussy. Like them all. Mm-hmm. Are you a plain Literally. sort of vanilla, chocolate, strawberry sort of person, or are you more like connoisseur? No, I like connoisseur. Well? Yeah, I like I like something a bit fancy. Hokey pokey, yeah. salted caramel mixed with chocolate fudge sundae. Ralph, I'm really hungry. I haven't had lunch yet. <laughs> what are you doing to me? What are you doing to me? Um, so, so we're wrapping up, are we, Ralph? We're wrapping up. It kind of feels that way. I feel okay, like we've, we've covered it all. So let's bring it full circle. Where should I be feeling it? Well, when the straps come together evenly at the end of the movement, you know you're doing it right. Well, maybe you should be feeling it in your abs. I'm not sure. No, I'm just joking. Oh, just joking. <laughs> Raphael. Oh, dear. Is it our job to tell a client where they should be feeling it? Well, you know what? I, I guess I just want to say, you know, obviously you and I agree that it, it's not it's not our job to do that. Um, but I think like, you know, I think for all the reasons that we've mentioned, but I think, you know, if, if I just want to say like, if you're a client out there or if you're an instructor out there and you've got clients who really want to know where they should be feeling it and you really want to tell them where they should be feeling well, good for you. You know, like, do your thing. Be proud. Like, Nothing, know. the world's not going to end. No yeah. one's going to die from it, you know. It's, yeah, exactly. It's just, exactly. It's just Pilates. But, but if you yeah. want our opinion on it um, and, you know, and we've presented some of the, some of the research, yeah, yeah, feel free to. Do that as well. And DM Chloe your favourite ice cream flavours and let us know if you try If you tried the um, digestive biscuits with ice cream thing and you like it, let us know. I think in, yeah. in America they call biscuits cookies. Oh, yum. That makes them sound even yummier. Yeah. yeah. I love that. Okay. I'm hungry. <laughs> Thanks, Rash. Bye. See ya.